if anyone's over here. Um, I just canceled going through OBS because that seemed to be just creating all sorts of problems. If anyone saw what was going on, yeah, it was creating problems. Um, so I just went straight through YouTube. So I'll, I'll go and fix stuff after. Um, I'm just doing some social media updates here for anyone who's paying attention. If they're not so frustrated, they just bailed on the whole whole exercise. Um, do, do, do. All right, well, that, um, hopefully, hopefully that's going to be what I need. Um, still looks a little out of focus. I might even have to, uh, have to fiddle with it a bit more. Put this up here. Oops. Getting all that sorted. See if there's anyone showing up to after all these technical issues. Someone's already liked it, so I, I guess that means someone's found it. Um, no, there's one watching. That might be me, actually. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll start with, oh, hello again. Hi, Anson. Yeah, um, I think I might have to... Uh, I might have to reinstall OBS because uh, it, it seems to be giving me constant little bugs that uh, the tutorials aren't immediately addressing, the ones I'm finding on YouTube. Um, so I might just have to reinstall, redo all the settings and see if that fixes it because it's been doing these weird things on startup a couple times now. And uh, I started earlier checking just because it's been screwed up. And um, I just ended up eating almost my entire afternoon sorting it and now having to redo the, the launch already. Okay, so um, again, so I'm going to talk at the beginning of my video because uh, I know there's a lot of people who watch this later on. Um, we're still in the sign-up phase um, for Coven, uh, the book of all my witches. Uh, so if you go to this URL and you'll see this, this page here. Well, actually, it's another witch here um, with a big butt. Uh, add your email uh, address in this bar, click get notified, and when this campaign launches, you'll immediately get an email, and you'll have uh, access to all the rewards that are available at the start. Rewards will be expanding as we go through the campaign, um, but there'll be an initial array of a whole bunch of items that you can choose from, and there'll be a lot of early bird specials. So as I understand it, we haven't, we haven't come up with a final price. We have a ballpark price. Um, but we don't have a final price yet. I think they're still crunching numbers and stuff. Um, and we have a bunch of stretch goals in mind already. And But there will be early bird options. So if you know you're getting the book and you signed up, you'll be able to get it at a, a slightly more affordable price. And, uh, and again, some people have asked me why I'm going with Zoop. Well, a big part of that is one of the options is I can hand the reins of all the fulfillment over to them. They take a bigger chunk of the total. Uh, of course, because they have all the costs now, but they will do all the fulfillment. They're experienced at this. They know what they're doing. They have a, a fulfillment uh, facilities already on hand. Uh, they're better at sourcing uh, the printing than any individual would be because they're, they're, they're doing, doing so much. Uh, so they'll be able to get a better price on that, which allows us, uh, me as a creator to do that, uh, to just have a better book come out. They have more experience specifically. So I, my, one of my impulses, well, let's do it as a hardcover book. And they just kind of went, no. Hardcovers are insanely expensive um, just to produce. And then shipping, it adds so much more weight. So the smarter thing would, would be to 
if we end up going into a partnership with a publisher to do mainstream distribution, that would be an option to do hardcovers. But doing doing uh, just the mail delivery with the hardcover and then the printing for the initially smaller print run would kill the campaign. Um, and I've heard this from other people doing other crowdfunding books, uh, unless it's like massive, like a really massive book. Um, so there's going to be a lot of options. One of the things you're going to be able to get, um, here's, put this book. I actually made these cards. I was, I was in, uh, uh, in, uh, Guelph, Ontario, uh, yesterday for a, a 25th anniversary event for the dragon, probably one of the uh, best comic stores in Canada. And not well, probably obviously one of the best comic stores in Canada. And I printed up a hundred of these cards, uh, to give away to people just to promote this. And it turned out really nicely. I thought, but it also made me realize I should probably put together a little book, a lookbook of like all the work that we have. Well, I gotta move the camera a bit so we can get this here. There we go. Um, I shall also probably move it up a bit. Hang on, dude. It's like a high budget movie, you got camera movement happening. There we go. All right, so uh, these are on hand. These are the Witchy Wednesday pieces I have not sold yet. These will be available to get with a book. If you like these witches or any of these witches that you saw when I was uh, doing the witchy uh, Wednesday string, uh, all of these will be available as add-ons to the book. And I think I explained this before. One of the things the uh, Zoop uh, people wanted me to do is do daily reminders. Uh, daily reminders about the mailing list. Um, because it's social media algorithms, crush creators, especially uh, non-video, non-food, non-bikini uh, influencers. If you just do two-dimensional art, you're just a photographer, an artist, you're kind of buried in the algorithm. So you have to post constantly to get any attention at all. So my decision was, I don't want to just bombard people with Here's a link. Please, please sign up. Please sign up. Please sign up. I so I decided I every day I post a link. I'm going to post a new little witch. They're going to be safe for work. Um, so I drew 30 of these headshots. And if you're following me on any social media, and I assume that most of you who, who are seeing this ha are, you will have seen. Um, most of these witches, these aren't put in order in my binder. Um, the one I just posted today was, I think, this one. This is the one I posted today. So that's the, today's the 17th. So that's the 17th, which I posted. We have 13 more to go. Lucky 13. And then we're going right into Witchtober. And those are going to be um, the full-size uh, drawings of 9, nine by 12. Uh, Bristol, I'll be using all the rubber stamps and when it's necessary, other um, ink techniques. And those will be posted every single day through the month of October. And as the new ones go up, they will be added to the campaign. So let's say the campaign launches on the 5th. Uh, it'll launch with all this material plus the first five Witchtober pieces. And then the next day, the sixth Witchtober piece will go up. And that'll happen every day all the way through the end of the month. And I think the campaign is going to last maybe to the end of the month, a little past. I'm not, we're not sure on the date yet. Um, but there will be that. There will be signed books, uh, other projects, projects I've worked on. Um, uh, I've done a ton of alternative covers. So... Um, I'll be having a bunch of those that are uh, both available to be signed and remarked. There is going to be a tip-in page, pre-printed, nicely designed. I have to draw that. That is going to allow for both signatures uh, at one additional add-on or an actual remark. We'll actually do a little sketch on high-quality paper that's designed for taking drawing, uh, writing, and sketching and everything. And I'll be tipped in. So you'll have an incredibly personalized book uh, with your remark in it. So, um, oh, I probably shouldn't YouTube and all that. This is probably safer to have up. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'm really excited. Um, tonight was going to be a short stream anyway, because all I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through how we do ideation uh, for when I do covers. I've done a lot of covers. Some, some of them are a lot easier to do than others. Um, but all of them require... 
exploring different ideas, uh, different quick sketches to play around with what you want to do compositionally. And I have, this is for me, it's a, it's a multi-stage step. First off, I, I take a, a pad of bond paper and um, I usually use my favorite um, 0.7 pencil with a nice big fat grip and sketch, but that won't show up on screen nearly as well as these 10B, 10B, matte black Faber-Castell pencils. Right? It's literally, it's like super matte. So this should show up right, really, 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 just a little mark here, right? That's a pencil, right? So that's that's really good. So uh, normally what I do is I'll, I'll sketch out a rough shape of a, a comma cover. I'm doing it a little bigger than I normally do. I usually, usually work on a smaller pad and I draw about, you know, eight. And um, and then I do a set of ideas. Now, the first idea I had is the witch hats are like really, really, really important. So I was thinking if you had um, just a series, like if a down shot, looking at all these witch hats. And um, and part of the reason why I'm focusing on the witch hats it almost looks like um, uh, traffic cones, really, really, really large uh, bases. But the uh, the gimmick for this cover, why is that not tilting up a bit more? Oh, is that better? There we go. No, as soon as I move it, it kind of comes back a bit, doesn't it? All this trouble, man. There, that's better. All right. So I could do like almost like a landscape of witch hats. Going back slightly in perspective. They're all standing adjacent to each other. It create a, a real nice weird rhythmic pattern. And as they get further back, it would, uh, it would be obviously just turning into almost like a dark shape. Right. And then in one of them, I can have one witch standing Smiling Witch, that I'll be, you know, see part of them, part of their faces underneath these witch hats. And they'd be, their silhouettes would show some sort of skin, but it's a cover. So I can't show uh, the nudity like I have on the inside. And it would just be so many witches. And the hats would eventually blend into a super, super dark shape. And you just have this one face that's kind of looking up at the viewer. So she would pop. I could even do her hat in a slightly different color, give it a red ribbon or something. So that's one of my one of my first ideas. So just to get the, the darkness idea across. And since it's going to be called Coven, Book of 100 Witches, to really get the idea across that there's lots and lots of witch drawings. Just this, this like sea of hats going into the background. And so all the title design about the hats would, would really, really pop. So it would be like, you know. Right. And so and I, maybe I might even do a little box. I just have the witches go all the way around like that. That that is my first idea, and it solves the issue of uh, the people of Zoop knowing that we don't want uh, any of the nudity on uh, that's inside the book on the cover. Uh, the implied nudity, because of the way the hats just reveal some of the witches behind, but not showing anything, um, is it would would be nice, and it would it would be a really really interesting visual, like the one witch looking up at the viewer and all the other witches are all just like standing together looking at us it'd be kind of like if you had like a whole bunch of people 
um, in a rainstorm, all holding umbrellas, so you can't see them, but one person's tilted the umbrella back and they're looking up at the photographer type of thing. Um, so that's what I'm thinking with the witch hats. And this is the leading idea I have. Uh, other ideas I have, I've, I pre-sharpened all my pencils so I can... Uh... The other idea I have is... Extreme close-up of the witch. Been drawing so many of these witches, I have like the shapes memorized. And just behind, it's just a sea of smaller witch heads with all their hats. Again, I'm playing with the hats. The hats and the uh, the, uh, the smiles are like obviously the big sticker, uh, visual sticking point for um, uh, for all these images. They're, they're the consistency, so they always seem to to run through there. And it'd just be a literal sea of of witches under the brim. And as we go up above the brim. We have witches under broomsticks flying through the sky, All right? And uh, if the hat's big enough here, Coven would sit on top of that in a nice little box with a book of 100 witches. So it'd just be this nice close-up of one witch. And then like all witches, all the witches on the ground, maybe one's holding a cat, another one's holding like uh, a raven. And then there would be um, um, all these witches under broomsticks flying across. Actually, one of the merchandising ideas I thought of, there is, there is a merchandising agreement I just made for uh, the very first uh, merchandising agreement for the witches for a small company. I'll be promoting that when that comes up. Um, but one of the ideas I had, I'm going to look into seeing like who would do this. I, I kind of want to do uh, witch Christmas tree ornaments. Um, these witches, I've already done a couple on broomsticks, but I draw a few more witches flying um and just sell them in a, in a set of um two or four finding out who would be wanting to do that and also which earrings with a little witch under broomstick is, is a set of earrings so those are two of the ideas i really want to do uh well let's take a look here uh do, 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 do. um the trick with uh, doing paperback and hardback is you have to you almost always have to hold you have to print them both you bind them at the same time, but then you warehouse the hardcovers for a certain amount of time. That's what the print market. Um, and the thing is, without an actual distributor, the mail is a terrible distributor for anything heavy. Um, it's amazing for, you know, 100 page paperback is remarkably cheap in comparison to a hardcover. As soon as you had a hardcover, you increase the shipping. The shipping prices become unfair to the backer. Even if they're willing to pay, it becomes unfair to the backer. Um, although if there, if, um, and we, there are talks about doing a, uh, direct market distribution version of the book later, um, and that would make a hardback available. And then it would probably be cheaper for anyone who wanted the hardback, if it happens to get that, than even book backing the book. So it's, it's a hypothetical, um, Hey, Raul. Uh, we'd like to thank you. Um, a shirt. Yeah, uh, I'd like to do shirts. Shirts are also, this is amazing. I mean, it's like I, I've backed so many Kickstarters and other campaigns, and some of them often ordered offered shirts, and some of the people I've talked to who did shirts, they lost so much money just changing the packaging uh, to include shirts. It's it's. The, um, the massive increase over the last few years of shipping on everything has has made anything outside of like there's going to be a print um, of the cover 
and but it's going to be the size of the book. If I want to do a larger print, I will have to go through another venue. And I I um I actually have one in mind. It either be for my art rep because we're very soon doing a print of the Frankenstein piece. Um, have I, have I shown the Frankenstein piece here? I'm looking in chat. Have I shown the big Frankenstein drawing and uh, we're doing a print of it through Cadence? There's always a time delay between asking a question and responding. I think I did, but I need, let me do it again. Hang on. Oh, yes. All right. You know what? I've already committed to showing it again because who knows? Um, people haven't seen it. So I drew um, this cover for the upcoming uh, Frankenstein Unbound art book based on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And it's, it's a big piece. Yeah, I think I did, I did show it last week because I remember looking at this on the camera. So uh, Cadence is doing a limited edition. I don't even know what the number is yet. It's going to be low because it's it, the paper they're using is astoundingly high end quality. Uh, so it's going to be in black and white. I did colors. I'm very happy with the colors. I believe I posted them on, on social media a few weeks ago or months um, over a month ago, maybe. Um, but I, I really, really love the black and white, black and white pen and ink is what I think of when I think of Frankenstein because of Bernie Wrightson and Bernie Wrightson's in my DNA, Bernie Wrightson, Bill Sienkiewicz, Frank Frazetta, um, um, Jeffrey Catherine Jones, all, all the most of the studio guys, Michael Kaluta, all those guys. You can see that stuff in my line work. Um, and um, so this is as much an homage to Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein as to all the other artists who made me fall in love with pen and ink so much. So we're doing um, through Cadence, we're doing uh, a printed on 13 by 19 paper, 100% cotton, super high quality, heavyweight. Uh, I, I teased a picture on, on social media, but or it has the uh, embossed Cadence uh, logo proving that it's a limited edition so no one can run around later and, and, and uh, put out a new version and say, hey, this is the same thing. So it's going to be um, signed, numbered with option to get have them remarked. So that's a little sketch. So it'd be a nice big space along the bottom. So I can do a nice uh, headshot uh, of the monster, of course. And um, yeah, I'm I'm just I'm really excited about this. And uh, so, and this is also coming out during Spooky Month. I believe we should have an, uh, the initial announcement maybe next week. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, October is going to be my month, man. <laughs> so yeah, so this is coming soon. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the stu the studio book. I'm on my second copy because uh, my first completely fell apart. Uh, all the pages fell out that I tried saving the initial pages. And I found another copy wasn't as, as good as my initial one was, but it's holding together. I assume at some point I'll have to replace that and it'll probably cost three times what I paid for this one, which was three times what I paid for the previous one. <laughs> um, uh, so these are, these are my two leading ideas. Another idea would be a wraparound cover, which is a little trickier. Um, to design and it might not necessarily be um, something good for, for the campaign um, because then if we do a print of the cover it's going to be it's, it's a wrap it'll actually be bigger on the book than it would be what gets delivered with the book but um, the idea would be On the back cover, so this is the back, and this is the front. So in the back, you'd see uh, the Coven House, which I've already. Uh, if if you've seen the goat drawing that I did, I think it was in December, one of the, one of the earlier, as we got closer to Christmas, I did a, a really big um, uh, piece, led by seventeen of a witch riding a giant black goat. Okay, so it would be the horizon of this with this, but we are traveling through the autumnal forest 
So do a treat right here on the spine so that, that actually uses that space well. And there'd be a line of witches. So the really small witches on the back as they approach through the forest. Doesn't matter if they're nude because you're not going to see any details. I don't think, and it's on the back cover, so it's going to be less problematic, right? But as we get into the front, there'd be like one witch. I swear, you, you draw something often enough, the, the, the geometry of the drawing just takes care of itself. It's like, I know, I, know, I know how to make one of these witches read. Oh, you can't even see that. Hang on. There we go. Um, so all, uh, the witches will get close. They'd overlap. And in such a way with the branches through the trees and everything, that nudity wouldn't be an issue. You'd know they're nude. You might see, you know, edge of breast, um, waist or something. But it'd be just all these witches walking through the woods. And it'd be some ravens in the branches. Um, and this is a piece I would absolutely love to do. It's like just this big, wide, epic, widescreen shot of the witches leaving the, the coven house. As uh, I, would, I, would, I would want it to feel like it's turning to night. So in terms of coloring, because I want this to be a color piece because I want those fall colors to come through. It'd be that sense of like you'd have that that sunset light coming through here. So it'd be bright enough to like all those trees and everything be nicely silhouetted, but still light enough to actually be readily visible towards uh, nighttime here. And the house, so then the lights of the house, and then the witches walking through, maybe some carrying torches or lanterns or something. And they'd all be approaching this forest and then entering into the forest. And the forest, you know, does the job of, of censorship for me. So no one gets in any sort of legal trouble for displaying the book. So that's that's what I, I and I'm thinking what I might do is um, if, if the talks would. Uh, this mainstream distribution happens. I'd want to, in a way, make an offer almost exclusively to the people who back the Zoop. Um, because I, I, there's part of me that's like, I don't like posting, you know, pointers to my, my coven sign up without something to look at. I would, I would do this. Um, I would very likely do this. And everyone who backs the Zoop would have like um, a full week to get in on the print run. It would be another limited edition print. And, but the people, it, the Zoop people, it'd be small enough that I think all the Zoop peoples that they bought it, they would get all of the print run. Um, so you'd have everyone, all the backers would have like that set period of time to get in on the print. And then it might be exclusively entirely to the Zoop people. And if there's any left over, then those would be made available outside of people who back the book. So this is my thought. And I may just do it on, it, on its own anyway, like if there is no, no book and I'll just make it available to everybody. But this would be my thank you for backing the book and allowing it to be big enough to be picked up by another publisher. You guys would get exclusive access, exclusive early access to a nice oversized, like I'm thinking like, 13 by 19 is a nice size, but I'm thinking bigger for this. And it would be a different um, print publisher who does amazing. In Nakatomi, um, they do amazing, amazing reproduction work. Um, so th those are people that go. And I'm actually thinking that this this might be like, I don't know, uh, 18 by 24, like a real big poster size image. And I would probably draw this like really huge too. So those are my thoughts for that. So... Uh, these are leading ideas. This is this is how I start. Okay, so I, I I've I actually did start on this uh, a couple of weeks ago. I did a whole bunch of like really really like really tiny like just get the the idea of um, the shape. I had, I had one of them where it's like it just had. It was she was looking back over her shoulder, as I've drawn a few times because then then you get to see the butt. I'm a big fan of butts. Um, and she's holding a broom and, uh, there's a little table there and there'd be a cat where you actually see her butt. 
and the cat's looking at the viewer and she's looking over her shoulder looking at you. It's a nice cute thing. Some of the ideas I had are are going to be harvested for Witchtober drawings. So I'm probably going to be doing this as a Witchtober drawing. I don't know if I'll have the cat blocking her butt, but there's going to be a cat looking at the viewer and a witch butt because I like butts. And if you've been following my witches, you know I like butts. Um, I'm just catching up in the chat here. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, the only thing that, that makes me think, because we, we, we know we want a nice little print of the cover to be separate from the book. So if, um, if, if you're a fan of my art and you'd like to hang a print of my work, this would be so small. It, it would almost feel like a postcard because you think of it, it's like, so it's, you'd see it bigger in the book, then you, you turn it. I mean, so you would see it like this big. But if you got a print of it, it would be that big. And, and, and that's like that. So that, that feels like a real disappointing size to print the cover then. It's so small, it's it's a postcard. Which, I mean, maybe if, if I go this way, um, that might be it. Instead of doing it, saying it's a print, we're going to give you an oversized postcard. So you can send it to your your the witchiest person that's closest to your heart. And you say, look at this book I got. I can send you this, but I got the book. Um, yeah, butt love is, is big love. Um, but yeah, there's a part of me that, um, this was actually my first idea for the cover, do a nice wraparound with the witches and then using the trees and like we could have ravens. I probably have some black goats grazing here, like just, you know, just a bunch of uh, goats grazing on the hill as the witches go by, maybe a witch petting a goat, just for a little bit of story, storytelling narrative there, and maybe some smaller trees in here. Cause like, if you remember the uh, the first Witch Tober ones, I did a lot of trees in the background. I love drawing trees. Um, but to do this justice, I really think that um, I want to save this for a big poster. I'm, I'm My fingers are crossed that uh, Zoop will make the connection. They're, they're negotiating now, but Zoop will make the connection. And we know that maybe a year from now, there'll be like um, a mass market edition. Uh, cause then it would be, you know, coincided with release with next October. And if we do that, this would be when I would have this beautiful giant pen and ink drawing that would digitally color and make an exclusive print. And the initial offering would be just to everyone who backs, backs the zoop. Just, just to say, you know, this is the acknowledgement that you supported me. Uh, you guys get first dibs on this and, and only make whatever. It would also be a limited edition, like maybe li- I'm thinking something that big would have to, because it'd be pricey, something that big would have to be limited to like 50 to 100. And then in, in theory, in, quite easily, I think 50 to 100 could be eaten up by all the people backing the book. So then that becomes a Zoop exclusive. And if the book's really, really big, theoretically, we could talk about, okay, if we go past the 50 or 100, keep the number the same for price. But just say, as long as you're from Zoop, you get this print. So then it becomes limited by just Zoop backers. And then I just don't allow anyone else to get it. So these are my these are my thoughts. I hope you like. Um, what was do, 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 do. I heard I haven't seen Elsa Chariter, Chari, 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 uh, her postcards. I heard about it. I love her work. Um, yeah. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love her work. So she's doing postcards. I like that. Yeah. So this is these these are the thoughts on the covers. I'm I'm leading I'm leading towards here. Let me do it. So I this right now I think A is the one I'm most likely going to do because there's going to be some sneaky little smiling witches here that you're going to see, but there's going to be one that's clearly heads up looking at us. Uh, I like this one because it's just a giant beautiful face. Uh, maybe like the top of the pentagram. Um, like almost like a short chain necklace here. Um, and then all the witches and then witches on brooms in the sky. And, and the nice big black black shape cutting through here, I think it makes for a nice design. Um, yeah, so this would be B. And C would actually be um, um, Zoop exclusive. Print. And I think I think I think this this uh, 
technically this could end up being a mass market cover and then but it would only be made as a zoop exclusive print that way i think i could because again i really do you guys hate it too when like someone puts out a, a, a crowdfunded book and then the exact same book goes to comic shops and they get it cheaper because they don't have to pay for shipping i kind of hate that i i feel that if there's two editions you gotta you gotta bend over backwards you gotta thank the people that supported you um so that's that's my take on it um how are we doing time wise so, so um god i started at like 7 15 um so this is the ideation uh of the process and i'm kind of going going into this i kind of thought i'd be doing like more different ideas but i i, I I didn't want to not have ideas when I got online tonight for this session. So I ended up kind of, I did about, uh, where are they? Where are they? Oh, they're not here. They're with my stuff from Guelph. Um, I did about 30, about this size. So you, I don't think these would show up very well on camera. But, um, so I did about 30. Some of them are just variations on this. Uh, one of them was, this was a little bit smaller, but you, you got another another witch here. And you got two witches here, and then you just saw hat peaks, and then the sky would just be clear with a little bit of a little moon, like so it'd be a dark sky with the moon. Um, that's what I like this one better with stuff flying through the sky and just dozens of witches in the background. Um, all the witch hats feels really strong to me. Feels like they're just a graphically strong uh, cover, and I also think it would make, make a nice, you know, that size print. Um, so I kind of arrived to the session initially thinking I'd be like showing you. Um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think uh, backers are incredibly important. You have to treat them, you have to treat them as priority number one. Um, so you guys support me on this book. If anything else happens with the book, well, you become the mailing list of first uh, first dibs on everything. I, I do the same thing with my Patreon supporters. You guys get first notification, everything. Patreon backers get to see everything first, so they know what's coming. I don't, I don't like surprising. Them. If you're supporting me, I, I, I feel it's my duty to reciprocate as much as possible. So, so what, what would happen here? Um, actually, it'd be kind of cool to get a little poll here if, in the comments. Um, say which one of A or B that you like most. Uh, that that could actually you know swing swing my my conclusion, but so once I fall in love with whatever I'm going to do, and I, I I it takes a lot, but eventually I do that. What I do is I take these uh, I pre-print these sheets like crazy. I do them for layouts, and I do it for covers. So they're they're scaled to uh, comic size, and I print these out. So this is. Um, Maybe I'll get a little closer in here while I'm talking about that so you guys can see this a little bit better. Oops. There we go. So you can see the uh, the blue lines for like the uh, live art area and then the crop line that's just on the inside of these uh, little, looks like ruler measurements. Um. And then the traditional boundaries for um, six or nine panel uh, grid, which allows you to do, you know, standard storytelling, which is th that use of space works really well in comics. So I, I, that's why I always put them in there. So you can see these slightly harder lines. So these two match up here at the bottom, right? So if I connect those, I get a nice, if the pages divide sentence right in half. If I want to do nine panel grid, uh, even though I don't have, I have the uh, live line art area here. here I'll, I'll, I'll show you. This is not specific to Coven, but it allows me to show you how I work. So let's say I want to do a nine panel grid. I know I'm working with the, the live art area. So I'm just going to darken all that a little bit so you see what I'm doing there. Is line showing up? It looks like it. All right. Probably terrible for anyone watching this on their phone. Every once in a while, like I'm traveling somewhere, I start watching an artist video on my phone, and I and I stop and I just go, no, I need to see this big, so I, I start watching it. So this is the live art area. So this is where you put all the lettering and the important art that you don't want to risk anything going wrong with the printer. Um, printing is at 
such a high standard right now, pr printing errors like that don't happen that often. Um, right up here, top edge here, I'm just gonna do this. This is the crop line. I'm gonna make it really, really dark. So this is everything that gets cut off. Now, because paper stretches a little bit when it's printed and it's on these big sheets, there's always a little bit of wiggle room. So there's, it's essentially, it's a quarter inch uh, when you're working in live art and the full size art, sorry. Uh, it's like a quarter inch that you, you draw anyway, even though you know it's gonna be cut off because you don't want, you don't want that weird kind of raw edge showing through. So all this stuff outside this line I drew would be cut off. So this is the comic page you would see when you open it up. And if you're, you know, trying to redraw Watchmen, you want a nine panel grid. So I already have these uh, measurements done. And this used to mess with my head. I, I was never great at math. Um, I, I think I got really bad. I, I think I'm pretty sure when I was playing football, I had undiagnosed concussions. Uh, cause I remember being okay at math, but not having to try to being terrible at math, even though I tried because suddenly it became hard and I don't, and I didn't know why it got hard. Yeah. I used to play like pads and shoulder pads and helmet football in uh, Canada and Winnipeg when I was growing up. Uh, so with, with blank paper with all these lines on it, it would be like, okay, how do I make three equal, you know, three equal top and bottom top middle bottom all the left right and center um so yeah so by putting all these lines in in advance um i can do my nine panel grids just like that and that's a little crooked i drew that line crooked i'll let it slip there we go there we go So if I was like, you know, doing the Watchmen, here's, here's my, my nine panels. I can decide which ones I want to uh, erase to make a bigger panel. And the wonderful thing about the nine panel grid, um, it's beat, 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 right? So the thing of that is like a drum beat, like, like very constant. But let's say it's set up, set up, set up, something big happens. Right. Suddenly, this is a huge panel, right? So it's it's beat 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 beat. Right. So suddenly, just visually, that becomes so significantly important, and that's one of the things I love about playing with grids. Um, grids, um, they're old fashioned, but uh, there's a part of me that just wants to be a solid storyteller. Well, I, I don't want the reader to ever be confused. I want to do cool ass pictures and layouts and all that stuff, but I don't want the reader to be confused for, for one minute. So if you have a grid, the reader knows where they're looking all the time. So when something changes, it gets their attention in a really, really way. If I did like really bizarro layouts all the time with like weird angle panels and they're all overlapping and everything, it, the page will look cool. Absolutely. I, I've done it. Um, but uh, no, something about the grid, the nine, the six panel, eight panel grids. Um, I've seen, I've, I've worked in the 16 panel grid. I did a, uh, a, a, a short three page story for Always Punch Nazis. And I used the, the Miller grid from Dark Knight. And that was fun. And it's really, really dense. I, I'd like another shot at the Miller grid because that was my first experience with it. Um, oh, hey, just catch up here. Thank you, Matt. Uh, or Ditko, Ditko too. Yeah, all those, all those. My God, Toth, Ditko, Kirby, masterful Kurtzman, especially. Uh, I'm really happy. If you're a Kurtzman fan, if you're not, you really should be. Um, I think he's the de facto master of EC storytelling. I mean, yes, you went on to Mad Magazine, but and I think my favorite, like I'm, a, I'm a big horror science fiction guy, but more horror than science fiction. Despite that, that being my leaning, Kurtzman War comics are my favorite EC comics. Because, well, to me, war is essentially hor uh, horror as a genre, if you do it right. Um, 
And um, if you don't have the hard covers that had come out over the last couple of years, the, the wonderful EC reprints, um, I think I think the latest one came out was the science fiction one. Uh, this month, it might, might even be this week, uh, Two-Fisted Combat's coming out in paperback. So I think it's radically cheaper than the hardcover. I think the hardcover is, what did it cost me, like 70 bucks or something, Canadian? Uh, so I think the paperback's like 40, 50. Uh, might even be cheaper than that. Um, yeah, if you really want to dig into like classic comics, Kurtzman, Kurtzman, so good. Uh, yeah, he was. And oh my God, I probably would have hated working for him. All the stories about his working process. He would He would do layouts with his script, send them to you. You would do your pencils and send it back to him. And then you do a tracing paper overlay of your pencils and do corrections on every single bit that wasn't perfect in his mind. And he was a perfectionist. And he'd send it to you and you'd have to fix it. And once you did the fixes, you send it back. And then he would do more corrections. And only then could you, if he was happy with it, only then could you ink it. And after you inked it, guess what? Tracing paper in notes for corrections. Um, and so working with Kurtzman, uh, although I understand that, especially when it, when it came to what the work he was doing, with little Annie Fanny at Playboy, you got really, really well paid. So, um, so that was one thing. You were doing regular comics and working with someone that monstrously controlling would be a good experience if it lasted no more than like four to six issues or something. After that, I'd never want to work with that person again. <laughs> ah, here we go. Yeah, the SF stories are so beautiful. The Wally Wood SF stories, the Al Williamson SF stories. Oh my God. So beautiful. I mean, it's like, they're all good. They're all worth having. I mean, I there's a part of me that wishes... They do an addition where they just re-lettered them so they weren't so Ames lettering guide. Because that is, that's still, a, uh, it's an ugliness on the high quality printing we have. Now, on the old crappy paper, you needed to read the stuff. But on the high quality, especially the glossy paper for the new editions, where the colors are like so bright, they didn't tone down the colors at all for the glossy paper, as they traditionally forget to do. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, do yourself a favor, at least go to a library that has and, and, and take a look at some just so you know what uh, what I'm talking about if you don't. All right. So, yeah, I'll just turn this upside down. So I hope you don't mind these digressions. I just love, you know, talking about process with people. So at some, at some point, I'm going to be doing more organized um, um, drawing instruction tutorials and comic tutorials. Um, but those will probably be uh, lined up in the series when I, I hook up with an editor who can consistently cut my bullshit out of the stuff and be more focused. All right. So that's that's how we use it for pages. Oh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm going to do another digression. Why are all these lines here on the outside? There is a perspective trick um, that I do. And do I have a nice, here, I need a chunkier, no, it's white. I have a chunkier black pen or marker that will really show up different from what I just did with the two. Oh, here's an eight. Okay. So there's a trick to doing perspective where you would, um, you don't have to set up anything other than the horizon lines. You don't have to set up like vanishing points uh, off the edges like I do. I'll do this like I'll go. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 So you do equidistant down one side. Uh, six, seven, eight. Eight. I'm counting eight of these and making a mark. Oops, like four. Eight. Eight. All right. So now I have all these, you know, really, really close together points here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if this is the towards the camera closer point of the line, I'm going to go down here. Okay. And then I'm going to go four. And I would, I would change this up every, every time I'd, uh, 
do different vast points. If you know perspective to a certain degree, you can actually do this quite easily. So one, two, three, four, four, four. Now it's not super precise, but what it does is it gives you the ballpark of a certain amount of perspective drawing. So what I do is to have that vanishing point, I'd lightly, usually with a blue pencil, but I want you to be able to see these lines. By using these page edges, uh, and you can do this bigger, smaller, you can do it within just for one panel. You can do it for, um, you can actually draw it in a much bigger piece of paper and then plot out lines going north. So you actually have, um, at this point, I usually eyeball them. I kind of go, okay, well, that looks like, that looks about right, right? That, I do that sort of thing a little bit. And then with the second color, um, see if I can do with that. Uh, I do something similar. I would go start up here and I'll, I'll, I'll say it's like one point perspective or something or two point perspective but we're right in the middle. Uh, four, eight. Oh, come on. Give me some red there. Give me some red, baby. Eight. 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 I'm not counting precisely, I'm just ballparking because again, since we're not doing super mathematically accurate perspective, it doesn't matter. So it's four, eight, and this will be down around there. And then I, around roughly the same point, I'll go over here and then I'll do every four. So we actually have a horizon line just from the overlap, because I'm being very simplistic with this. Whoa, bubble. That's why I don't use these graphic pens. This is like one I bought. It just immediately splitches everywhere every once in a while. So I have other paint markers I use that are more reliable. This is, I might have actually bought a bad, I bought these right away, these uh, graphic line painters. The black actually never does that, but the red always does that to me. I have to, let me get a little paper towel and blot that. You know, let me blot the whole thing because these might not be dry yet. All right. And then I match red line to red line, red dot to red dot. Again, I'd probably use a different colored pencil. I have these um, uh, 0.5 mechanical pencils that have different colored leads in them. Blue, red, yellow, green. Never use the yellow because it never shows up. But um, the green, the blue, and the red are really handy. I miscounted. <laughs> oh no, no, here we go. It's close enough. There we go. And then I have all my vanishing points all sorted so I can actually just start sketching like, here's a box in perspective here. Because I have all these lines going where I just kind of have to almost run to parallel to them. And um, I get a somewhat accurate perspective, uh, all I need. And uh, it just makes things so much easier. Just 
Yan. And if I did these in like colored pencils, you would actually um, get that more vertical. Um, the pencil would pop right on uh, right on top of it, so you'd actually get a really nice, clear idea of uh, um, what lines you're supposed to look at. It's a little hard when when you start doing any sort of like multi um, multi line involved perspective with people who haven't studied perspective. They they start looking at lines and go, how do you know which ones are which? And it's like, well, you know, because you put them there. Um, you can also do like lighting. For shadows. So as soon as you have some perspective on the page, if you if you study a little bit of perspective, a lot of that stuff just starts adding up, um, because you, you as soon as you see that some information, all the other information gets uh, exposed to you. Anyway, 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 that's that's why those lines are there, so I can do that that sort of perspective stuff fast and easy. But what I also do is because this is scaled exactly to what I need for uh, a cover. Um, I can start doing things like just sketching out. Want our face to come down here. Want our face only be this much under that, so our head is about that big. I have to think about the hat brim. How much of the hat's going to be coming in? Swoop down like that, curving down, coming back like that. So I a wonderful thing about working on paper like this, I can actually draw way over over there. And this is actually very small. So what it is, I can start. I always have the hair, like uh, the hair under which it had generally, I have a kind of hat pressed down by the hat near the temple. So it usually cuts off part of their cheek if they're on one side of them or the other. Just just one of the things I've been working at with, with these ladies for this long. Already I'm thinking that this might be too big to allow me to draw much in the way of other witches here. So I only get like maybe one, maybe two or three here. And then just, there'd be nothing but like black pointy bits. Uh, but this is a nice size to look at. I mean, this big a face on the cover generally draws a lot of attention. So that's kind of a good thing. So if I was happy with this drawing, and I'm not, it's too big. It really is too big. Um, I think I can actually reduce this to push her head up to this level, the brim level here, have her face a little bit smaller there, not coming in there, and then maybe having the pentacle partially cropped. Because a lot of people, someone actually responded to I think it was on Instagram to one of the other witch headshots asking if um, she was a Satanist because of the upside, upside down pentagram. And I'm like, Oof. the history of the pentagram predates uh, Levi declaring that the upside down pentagram was a satanic symbol. 
and that was in 1885, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 1885 that uh, Levi wrote his book about witches and he decided that the upside down pentagram was a satanic symbol. And that's not the case. It was actually before he did that, the pentagram was just as much used by Christians as any other culture because it, it had so much significance. And um, the only real difference, it didn't really matter. I mean, it's like, um, um, so you'd have your uh, right side up pentagram. And the idea being that um, this part here, like the top is the spirit. And the other one are the four elements, right? And there was a very uh, maternal aspect of this because it was the four outward points protecting the womb, right? Now, I can't remember which one's earth, air, water, fire, right? So that's why I'm not labeling, but I know that the one point that's giving it a direction was the spirit. So it was uh, earth and spirit. And the ideal being that you're grounded in the earth and you're trying to evolve your spirit upwards, okay? Uh, and that's that's the pagan interpretation. Now the upside down pentagram, as I understand it, because I'm I'm an atheist. I'm not. I, I don't worship anything, but I like research. So the upside down pentagram, which I've just drawn terribly fat and everything here. Uh, this is, and I think I think Levi put in there because you know you get the goat in there, right? Right. So um, I like playing with the idea of the black goats because it pisses people off who are terrified of them. But I also know that the inverted pentagram where the spirit's pointing downward okay is not is not um an evil indication of pointing your spirit downward is bringing your spirit back in inward to develop the self so these are still representing the elements but pointing your spirit downward instead of trying to elevate your spiritual aspect upward what it is is when you when it's downward you're trying to develop your spirit within it's like this is when you're everything's working for you and i'm not a pagan so i can't i may not be capturing all the nuance but if you're at peace in the world and you're just trying to work on your spiritual aspects this is your pentagram however if you're struggling and you need to do work on yourself or you need to support yourself or you need to take care of yourself this is the aspect of the pentagram this is self-care this is this is developing higher aspects of how you treat yourself, how you treat other people, all that stuff. So that's the spirit level. This is when you've gone through trauma and you need to heal or you have to find your sense, your sense of balance again. So that's, and honestly, the idea that I'm dealing with, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of narrative stuff I've come up with after drawing. If you can't come up with stories after drawing uh, over 70 witches, um, I don't know what you're, what you're doing, but um, the witches have the inverted uh, pentagram as a symbol because they're all dealing with the trauma that the world put them through before they made the decision to become witches. The witches in my story are rejecting the world at large because it's an ugly place and they're happier and at peace in their coven. Um, so that might be too dark a comment, but uh, uh there we go. Yeah, yeah, as it, you were absolutely right. So those those are the terms that uh, uh, I've read. Those are the ones uh, transcending, tr overcoming the earth, you know, and manifesting yourself in the earth. But I'm I'm working. This is this is my interpretation of it. So when if I, if I get to do a witch graphic novel, um, there'll be more about this type of stuff and how how they become witches and why you never see their eyes and why they don't wear anything, why they have the fishnet gloves. I got, I got reasons for all that stuff. Some of it I might change when I get there, but I have reasons right now that I'm sticking with. So, yeah, so this is after I, 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 I settle on a thumbnail idea I like, I transition to drawing them printed size. So this is roughly, it's not even, it's not really printed size. It's obviously smaller. If I grab the comic, do I have one? I got graphic novels nearby, but I don't have any comics nearby. So this is about, you know, comics about this big. Right. So drawing at this size, I'm actually getting to see pretty close to what it looks like printed. And I can do my base initial drawing. And if I if I get this to the point I like or I, there's elements in this I, I like, I will scan it. Uh, this is this is scannable, but I'd scan it. 
I'd blow it up to 11 by 17, so standard art size. I'd lay it underneath uh, bond paper, but a bigger bond paper pad. Here, I'll show you. I know I've, I've talked about this before, but you know, it's always someone's first uh, stream. So I work on this bond paper. Um, and it's not flipping up there. But they have the damn tilted table. And um, so I print out 11 by 17 on, under, and I put under a sheet of a bigger pad. So I have the drawing more or less where I want it. Then I could refine the drawing at the full size. And I would still scan that again, clean it up, tweak it, flip it around a little bit in Photoshop to look for errors. Uh, and then I would print it out in light blue on artboard and then just do all the ink magic and white paint and stuff and maybe rubber stamps there. So it's a lot of process, but um, I, I think I think the thing I learned most studying the classic golden age illustrators and then the people they taught, process is everything. It, you have to learn how to draw, you have to learn composition, you have to learn all these things, but you have to have a work process that works for you so you can incorporate your knowledge in a holistic process towards getting the image you want. Um, a lot of classic illustrators, they would they would do these cartoon studies of just the individual figures in their painting so they fully understood them. Then they do these cohesive studies. And then once they have a cohesive study, they do a small, like, like really small, like let's say they're painting a big 18 by 24 painting uh, as an illustration. Then they would do this little um, uh, nine by six painting with the media based on the drawing. So they'd recreate the drawing small and they'd use either the same or, or a faster drawing medium like gouache to really understand and see what that image is gonna look like. So they'd have that little pre-done painting. Uh, what I do now is I will I will take a piece and either I'll print it out and hit it with markers, but I don't really like using markers that much anymore. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll quickly add color in Photoshop to get a sense of what it's gonna look like when I color it. And I'll print that out. So when I'm actually digitally coloring a piece or painting it, um, I have that to refer to. So there's less mental work and more of it's like just breaking down. This is the color I need to mix. This is how it interacts with the other colors around it. So you're you're reducing the the RAM usage as an artist by having all these steps uh, that you're attacking in, in, in a specific level. So, oh, okay, eight twenty one. I think. Okay, let me take a look here. See here. Uh, graphic novel would be amazing. Yes, I have have an idea for a, um, a 48 to 96 page um, graphic novel that would be told in a narrative segments. Uh, so it'd be chapters um, about a witch, join, a young woman joining the coven. And as she goes through the whole process to becoming one of these type of witches, the witches tell her what's going on. You see what the witch's life is like. The relationships with other supernatural creatures, um, and it would be almost like her first year as a witch as a story. So right now, I know I got about eight, eight to twelve segments. So that would be um, sixty-four to. I, I, I generally sketch them out in like eight-page bits, um, but I'd like it to be. I'd like it. I feel like as as a graphic novel, if you're under ninety pages, you're not a graphic novel. It's just a really big fat comic book. And that's because I grew up with those 64 page giants that DC used to publish back in the day. And that just feels like a lot, uh, that feels like a good kind of comic that should, can still be uh, side, side bound. But as soon as you get it around 90, uh, that's, that's when it becomes a book. That's when perfect binding really, really matters. That's when it feels like a book and it can be dense with content and it feels like a good story. That, that's, that's, I think 90 pages is the minimum to qualify as a, as a, as a graphic novel in today's world. All right. Um, I think I think I'm going to wrap this up here because what I'm going to do as soon as I end the stream, I'm actually going to seriously start working on on on, on this cover. And I'm also before I wind down, I'm going to pick up on that Elric piece again. So yeah, let me put this back up on the screen for a bit. So um, I would appreciate it very much if you like and subscribe, so you get notification. Um, especially if if there's like a screw up. If you subscribe, you get notification when I post a new video or I go live. I, that's the way I understand it with the people I follow. So if there's a screw up like today where OBS just not, was not working for me, I ended up, you know, having to just go live, you would still be notified and I believe sent a link to the video. So if you subscribe to my channel, that's great. 
Um, liking it is really nice. Apparently there's like benefits. More people will see it, the more videos liked. Um, so that's the YouTube aspect. Uh, the coven aspect is if you haven't already signed up, please sign up because, um, like I said, there's going to be early bird, um, pricing on the books. And I don't know how many will be at the early bird price. And I've seen other, uh, uh, crowd funders where, they do like 50 early bird specials and they sell out like immediately. So then they'll add another 25. So I don't know. I, I think Zoop would be willing to do that. Like in the first 24 hours we sell out, we'll probably add more just so more people can take advantage of it. Um, and that automatically more people buying the book is, is just better for the book. But um, yeah, so it's going to be, a, I know it's initially going to be supported on this device. I don't think I said my Amazon device's name. I don't know <laughs> why she said that. I wonder if that picked up. Um, yeah, so please sign up so you get notified. And next week, um, um, I will have fully penciled the cover. And so I'll be doing a session just showing me showing you my inking uh, process on the cover. So, um, So I hope you all show up next week. Um, I want you all to have an amazing week and only good things happening to you. And that's it. Good night, everybody.